Now, 67 years ago, Jackie Robinson became my teammate and friend. Uh, at that time, sharing this space with him would have been absolutely unimaginable. And today it still is. It's one of the greatest honors of my life. <clears throat> I'm also honored to have two very good friends here. Clayton and Joe, thank you for being here. Thank you for the kind words. It's been fun knowing you. Conventional wisdom has always said, don't give an old man a microphone. You've got too many years to talk about. Well, I try not to, but I'm going to start way back at the beginning. <laughs> In high school, my life was all about basketball. I didn't even think baseball existed. After my senior year, senior year of basketball was over, I decided, well, I'm going out for the baseball team because my best friend was their best pitcher, Fred Wilpon. So I said, okay, I'm going out for baseball. Now, they had two other good pitchers, so I ended up either in right field or first base, wherever. But our catcher was a guy by the name of J uh, Walter Laurie. And Walter's father, Milton, ran a Sandlot baseball team. And he was at our practices and games sometimes. And I have to thank him. I think he started this journey here. He asked me to come pitch for his team. And I didn't know what the hell pitching was, basically, but I said, okay. He worked for the old journal, American newspaper, and on game days, his delivery van became the team bus. And his getting me to this point probably wouldn't have happened without him. That summer over, I went to the University of Cincinnati. I wasn't really a walk-on, I was invited to come. I didn't have a scholarship, but I was invited to come out. Uh, I did make the team, I was a starter, I wasn't great, I wasn't bad. But the freshman coach was Ed Jumper, who was also the baseball coach. So, the baseball team was going to New Orleans and I decided I won. So I volunteered, I became a pitcher. You know, freshmen weren't eligible, so on that trip I pitched against an Air Force base, and during the season I pitched in two non-conference games. And with that great non-experience -experience, experience, that winter I signed a contract to pitch for the Brooklyn Dodgers, which is even more surprising than the thought of playing for the New York Knicks. And it just didn't do really. But summer, uh, winter over, spring training off the Bureau Beach with absolutely no clue of what to do. And the, as Charlie said, the only reason for me in the big leagues, the owners had come up with a new rule to save them from giving out bonuses. If you got over $4,000 to sign, you had to spend the next two years in the major leagues. Uh, my presence on the roster wasn't, you know, a happy experience for a lot of people. He took other people's jobs, uh, maybe he took somebody else's job. But Jackie went out of his way to make me feel welcome, and I'll never forget his kindness on that. The team was pretty special in 1955. If you think that five guys on that team are now in the Hall of Fame, and one more should be. You know, Don Newcomb was probably the outstanding pitcher at that time. And Don took me aside right away and said, pitching is hard work. If you're not working hard and you're making it easy, you're not doing it right. And I believe that, and I lived by that after that. The Dodgers' success in the early, uh, the late 50s, early 60s, has the fingerprints of so many people on it. Uh, it it's hard to describe how many, how so many of them performed so well to put us in a position to play on the grand stage, the World Series. Uh, the list of people is incredibly long, but I'm gonna go through some as quickly as I can. My first pitching coach, Joe Becker, believed in me from the start and I never figured out why. My second pitching coach, Lefty Phillips. My manager, Walter Olson, I was my only manager, I'm not sure he was that happy with me to, as a bonus player, but we came to have a pretty good relationship through the years. 
all my roommates, you know, Doug Camilli, uh, Norm Sherry, Carl Farrelly, Dick Trzewski. We spend so many hours in one room, you become like family. Most of all, I thank my teammates, all of them. All of the catchers. There's a special relationship between pitchers and catchers. John Roseboro is basically my catcher most of the time, and our relationship is incredible. Never any doubt. Uh, when I look for a sign, it's really what I wanted to throw. John didn't create any doubt in my mind. Our all switch hitting infield, uh, Jim Lefevre, uh, Wes Parker, Jim Gillian, Maury Wills, uh, they were great defensively. Jim Gillian played anywhere you needed him. Maury Wills came up in the middle of 1959 and made himself, for sheer will, the most potent offensive player in the game. Every base hit, every walk was a double or triple. Uh, Willie Davis ran down with his speed, ran down all your mistakes, as long as they stayed in the ballpark sometimes, couldn't do anything about it. Uh, Tommy Davis was probably one of the outstanding hitters at that time. And you look at his numbers in 1962, where he batted 346, and had incredible 153 RBIs. Uh, it was great. Uh, it was just hard to, to remember everybody. We had two relievers who were, you know, I guess late men, but the late men then might have pitched three innings. In 1963, Ron Paranowski was 16 and three in relief. In 1966, Phil Regan was 13 and one in relief. So they weren't pitching one inning at the end. They were pitching quite a few. And all the other guys who sat in the left field bullpen, who the starting pitchers did their best to then sit there and keep them out of games. Didn't always work. Uh, our starting pitchers, Johnny Padres, Claude Osteen, Joe Moeller, Don Sutton, is the Dodgers' only 300 game winner. And of course, Don Dreisman. We were together for 11 years <coughs> and grew up together. Uh, I think we're friends, but I think in some ways we're competitors because he standard a set of, you know, an excellence that I tried to live up to. I tried to set an excellence that he lived up to, and I think it made us both better. Uh, I can't forget Al Farrar just because he's from Brooklyn. Lou Johnson, who came to the team, and his joy and his infectious spirit made our clubhouse, not to mention a few big hits, but made our clubhouse a very special place. Uh, Frank Howard, uh, you know, not much to say about him, except that some of the balls he hit may still be going, I don't know. Our trainers, Bill Bueller and Wayne Anderson, did their best to keep us on the field and perform. Inside the clubhouse, our equipment manager, and also a good friend was Nobu Kawano. Ben Scully. Well, there's a lot of talk these days about the greatest of all time. Goat used to be a bad thing. Now it's the greatest of all time. Well, that's the end of the discussion. Vince Gully is the greatest of all time, period. No discussion. It's him. <laughs> the owners were great owners. The O'Malley's were great owners who did their best to make our lives pretty well good. I think, I think my only regret today is that so many are no longer with us, and I am unable to let them know how much I thank them and how much I appreciate them. Thank you to all the fans who treated me so well, and tell them how lucky they are to have had competitive teams to root for for so many years. Uh, Andrew Friedman and his staff have done their best to provide players for Doc. And the owners who made these teams possible, the Waltons, the Patmans, Todd Holloway, Peter Goodwin, Van Castle, and of course, my other favorite, number 32, Magic Johnson. Uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. And for all who came out, thank you. My family and friends, thank you very much. I love you one and all. I'm done.